Good day, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining um, today's Iowa webinar, which is looking at safely managed sanitation, introducing the new WHO learning package. So just some background information on uh, the protocols for the webinar. So this webinar will be recorded and it will be made available on demand on the Iowa Connect Plus platform, uh, the presentations and slides and all other information. So the speakers are the ones who are responsible for securing the copyright permissions for any work that will be presented. The opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, or recommendations contained in the presentations and other materials are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect Iowa's opinion. So uh, for feedback or questions, uh, there is a chat box and there is also a question and answer box. So please use the chat box for general requests and interactive activities. And for the question and answer, uh, you can use the Q&A box. Uh, to send the questions to the panelists and they will be answered during the discussions and also in the post webinar materials. So just to give a, uh, a background, uh, what the sanitation um, program is like, we're doing this under the inclusive urban sanitation, uh, which is an Iowa initiative to reshape the global urban sanitation agenda by focusing on inclusive sanitation service goals and the service systems required to achieve them. This is looking beyond infrastructure and technology. So it's meant to engage the public, the private and academic sectors to share their experiences and define global goals and fundamentals of a public sector, sector approach to service outcomes, also known as citywide inclusive sanitation. The initiative is being progressed through a sanitary Senate Action Campaign, which is Iowa's global call to action on inclusive urban sanitation. So, so far, an advisory board and task force have been formed to spearhead um, this program. Uh, in terms of what is happening as well, um, the aspects of safety, inclusivity, and multi-technology dimensions are being fully integrated into the urban sanitation concept worldwide. This means that the concepts and norms are being defined uh, and also for SDG 6, as well as uh, these dimensions being mainstreamed within Iowa's knowledge creation instruments and dissemination channels. So the citywide inclusive sanitation framework uh, considered within the international sanitation community and, and beyond through Iowa's communication channels. So that is the whole uh, drive for the CIWIS framework. So far, the actions that Iowa is planning is that there should be an Iowa journal on special issues um, on inclusive urban sanitation and other publications focusing on low uh, income countries, including white paper and position papers. They also web in a series. This is one of them. And learning sessions uh, included focusing on trainings and um, MOOCs. M -O 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 -Cs. Um, there are blogs, stories, um, series, including podcasts and documentaries. You'll find the stories online um, on inclusive urban sanitation from a number of countries. There's also the launch of a biennial innovation conference, an inclusive urban sanitation champions program at the Water and Development Congress and Exhibition in Kigali from 10th to 14th December and also a consultative process, which is a globally acceptable CWIS framework and also assessment guidelines. So these are being developed through consultative processes. So this is the Iowa uh, Initiative for Inclusive Urban Sanitation. Now coming to today's webinar, which is looking at the WHO learning package. Um, the agenda is basically uh, looking at uh, part one. There's, there are several parts to this. So on the part one, we have the health rationale for safely managed sanitation. We have definition for safely managed sanitation. Then the third part is looking at the four key recommendations of the WHO guidelines, followed by how to embed safely managed sanitation in national systems. Part five is risk-based tools to implement safely managed sanitation uh, planning and also risk-based tools to implement uh, uh, SMS through sanitary inspections. And we will have polls and quizzes uh, during this uh, webinar. So please pay good attention and let's see who gets it right. 
So we have a very uh, gender balanced uh, team, uh, all female, uh, giving us the, the presentations. We have Kate Medlicott, who is the sanitation team leader within the WASH team. We have Sophie Boyson, uh, who's the uh, technical officer in the team. Uh, Batsirai Majuru, also a technical officer in the WHO team. Yonela uh, Dillon is a sanitation safety planning consultant for the WHO, and she's been involved in several trainings. And we have two experts joining us on the panel, uh, Charlotte, who's an environmentalist and program manager in Ghana, and also Dr. Vijay uh, Sharaseya, who is a joint advisor um, in the government of India. So I will be handing, um, over the button to the team as we look at the learning objectives. Uh, at the end of the session, we expect that the participants should know the health rationale for safely managed sanitation, understand the key recommendations of the guidelines on sanitation and health, know where to find monitoring and implementation definitions for safely managed sanitation in each step of the chain, and have a better understanding of where and how to embed definitions into national systems, and also have an introductory understanding of risk-based tools to implement safety managed sanitation. So if there will be also information on where to find more on these guidelines, trainings, and tools. There are also key resources available online, and we will be able to uh, get the links to these resources for the guidelines, uh, the sanitation safety planning, and sanitary inspections. So to begin um, the, the learning is Kate uh, Medlicott, over to you on the health rationale. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Let's get going. So we are WHO, so I'm going to start on the health rationale and answering, answering the question, why do we need safely managed sanitation? Why has the goalposts shifted from ending open defecation? So we can think about the health impacts of poor sanitation in three categories. The first is infectious disease, particularly diarrhea and cholera, which is raging at the moment. Helminth infections, those are intestinal worms, and also insect and vector-borne diseases that like to breed in feces and wastewater. Secondly, we have the consequences of those infections, so things like stunting, um, impaired cognition, pneumonia, and anemia. And then more broadly, as WHO uh, health is not just the uh, absence of disease, but also broader well-being. So the impacts on school attendance, for example, anxiety, shame, and so forth that's associated with, with privacy. So with all of these impacts in mind, how have we been doing? What we can say is that we know sanitation is meant to deliver cost-effective uh, health and economic benefits. But when we look collectively at the evidence, which we did kind of looking at over a thousand papers as part of the guidelines on sanitation and health, what we found is we're not having as much impact as we might like. So we need to move to safely managed sanitation to ensure that we're reducing health risks and delivering real health impact with the investments we're making in sanitation. So if you'll let me show you a little of the epidemiology, this is a paper that came out a few years back. And what you see here, each one of these dots is a major epidemiological study looking at health impact of water and sanitation. Where this line is here at one, it means really there was little or no health impact associated with this intervention. And what you see on the bottom is what the conditions were like at the end of the study. So 16 as being a very dirty environment and two being very clean. What we see is when until we get a very clean environment, we get little health impact. But then when we're getting to that, that finishing the job, we see these health impacts arriving. And that's why we need safely managed sanitation. I'll explain more. OK, so many of you will be familiar with this old F diagram, which has been very helpful in, in uh, getting us to think about how disease transmission happens from one person practicing open defecation to a new host. However, it has some flaws, in fact, because sanitation is more than a toilet. We know that it has the, the, um, the service chain, which is the toilet, containment, conveyance, treatment, 
end use and disposal and with that great opportunities for circular economy and reuse. And notice that many of those parts past the toilet are not in control of the household. So when we look at the new F diagram and the guidelines, what you can see is we unpack the sanitation service chain and make it clear that these hazards exist all the way along the sanitation chain, not just at, at the toilet, but risks that can occur uh, at all of these steps. So what I'm going to show you now is, is to demonstrate some of these risks using what might be familiar as an excreta flow diagram. So coming in on the left side, we see different sanitation service types, sewered, non-sewered, or lack of sanitation, which is you know, open def defecation, and risks that can happen at that point are things like the lack of toilet or dirty toilets and no hand washing facilities. When we go to the conveyance step, we see additional risks such as fecal sludge spillage during um, manual or motorized emptying or septic tanks that are full and overflowing into the local environment. At the conveyance step, we might see leaky or overflowing sewers, we might see dumping of fecal sludge into local water bodies or directly onto farms. And at the treatment step, we, we might see uh, poor functionality of treatment plants or lack of treatment plants altogether or poorly matched uh, treatment levels with the intended reuse down, downstream. So I hope this gives you a flavour of why we need safety managed sanitation and the risks that can occur all the way along the sanitation chain. As we go into the next uh, presentations, we'll unpack this further. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Sophie Boisson, who's going to talk about definitions. Sophie. Thank you very much, Kate, and, and great, uh, great to, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. So, um, so following from Kate's uh, presentation, so what, what counts as safely managed sanitation? So um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this figure by now, and this is the WHO UNICEF uh, Joint Monitoring Program Service Ladder on Sanitation, which is currently used to monitor progress against SDG Target 6.2. Compared to the one from the MDG period, this ladder includes a new rung of safely managed services. So to be defined as safely managed, uh, people need to be using an improved sanitation facility that is not shared with other households, but also which ensures that the excreta collected remain isolated from human exposures. And this is defined in three ways. Um, excreta, excreta can be transported through sewers to a treatment plant. This is what we call a wastewater treated offsite. They can be emptied from a local storage pit or tanks and conveyed to a treatment plant, and we call that emptied and treated off-site. Or they could simply remain in the ground and eventually be treated and disposed of in situ. While this definition is very useful for monitoring purposes, when it comes to programming, uh, we need much more nuanced uh, definition. So in the guidelines on sanitation and health, you will find more detailed information on what safe means at each step of the sanitation service chain, from toilet throughout to, um, to end use and disposal. Chapter three includes considerations on design and constructions, on operation and maintenance, um, as well as some incremental measures. So these definitions are really designed to guide uh, program implementation, but I just wanted to emphasize that they are completely in alignment with the measurable definitions that are used for SDG monitoring. So now we'll hand over to Yvonne, who will take us uh, through the first quiz. Over to you, Yvonne. Thank you very much. Um, you, you heard from the two presentations, and now let's uh, check if uh, you have picked some information from the two presentations um, through a small quiz. So there are three questions um, in this quiz. And uh, when you see the quiz on your screen, uh, you pick this, the correct answer and you scroll down uh, to the next question until you, you finish and uh, submit. So the first question along the sanitation service chain, failures put human health at risk 
failures which put human health at risk are most likely to occur where? So you have to choose one. Is it with a toilet, during containment, during conveyance, during treatment, during end use or disposal, or any of the above? And the second question, what is the GMP definition of safely managed sanitation for global monitoring of SDG 6.2? What is the SDG definition, the HMP definition of SDG 6.2? Is it use of improved facilities shared between two or more households, use of pit latrines with slab or platform hanging, or bucket latrines, use of improved facilities which are not shared, use of improved facilities which are not shared with other households and where excreta are safely disposed in situ? or removed and treated oxide or disposal of human feces in fields, forests, bushes. The third question, how are the definitions of safely managed sanitation in WHO's guidelines on sanitation and health linked to the JMP definitions of safely managed sanitation? Only one choice, provide more detail on design, operation, and maintenance for implementation, Define what safe means at each step of the sanitation service chain, align with the GMP definitions, help in understanding what is most relevant for monitoring locally, or all of the above. So I hope you've got your answers and you've been able to answer the three questions. We now, um, I think in the next uh, few seconds, we close the quiz uh, and uh, we see what the correct answers should be. And most people answered D, 88%. I'm disappointed with my participants. The correct answer is F, which is all, all, all of the above. Um, Cause failures at any step of the sanitation chain can result in negative health outcomes. So most of the chain is outside the direct control of the householder. So it's critical that all actors, including local and national governments and the private sector do their part to ensure that the risks are managed along the whole sanitation chain from beginning to end. On question three, most answers were for E, all of the above, and only 1% answered correctly, which is D. The answer is use of improved facilities which are not shared with other households and where excreta safely disposed in situ or removed and treated offside. That's the JMP definition for SDG 6.2. Or did I mix them up? Ah, my my bad. Okay, so no, most of the correct answers were actually um, F, D, and number three is E. I had uh, looked at the wrong question. So thank you so much for answering uh, correctly. So we move on to the next presentation, um, which is um, on to the next presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, which are, we are now looking at the four recommendations of the WHO guidelines. Uh, Sophie, back to you. Thank you, Yvonne, and uh, well done, participants, for this first quiz. Um, so as we've heard earlier from Kate's presentation, um, we know that current sanitation efforts um, are not achieving the health gain that we would anticipate. And so the question is, um, what, what really needs to change? So in the WHO guidelines on sanitation and health, you will find four key recommendations. So let's unpack, and let's unpack each of the recommendations. So let's start with recommendation one, which is really focused on safe toilets. So, so to improve health, well-being, and human rights all, we need to ensure that toilets are used by everyone in the community. So there is evidence that low or partial coverage still means people are exposed to the excreta of others uh, that do not have toilets. So no one is really um, safe until everyone is. Um, I must say, though, that uh, dignity, uh, human rights and well-being benefits are achieved for those uh, that have toilets. The second point is, uh, is to highlight that while individual uh, sanitation is the goal in some places, uh, we know that shared or public toilets uh, may be the only interim option to make sure everyone has a safe place to go. The third, um, the third element is, uh, is really highlighting that uh, toilets and containment should meet some minimum safety standards. Um, in fact, going from open defecation to an unimproved 
uh, toilet is not likely to improve health impact. In fact, it could make the situation worse in some cases. And likewise, we need to ensure that pits or septic tanks um, don't pollute the groundwater or the local environment. The fourth one is uh, it's important to work on creating demands for toilets. So as we know, the CLTS is a classical example uh, where we need to, um, to conduct behavior change uh, programs, but at the same time, we need to ensure that there's a supply chain um, to meet that demand by supplying safe, affordable, uh, and desirable toilet options. And lastly, we need to be thinking about the places uh, where people need to use a toilet as they go about their daily life. So whether it's at home, at school, in healthcare facilities, at work, or in public places. So recommendation two um, is focusing on the whole sanitation service chain. And we know this is where we get the major health gain as it was highlighted in previous slides. Um, this is especially uh, true in urban areas. So we know that, um, that most of the, the, the sanitation chain are actually is outside the control of households. So households can't really do it alone. So we really need to consider what happens uh, after the toilets. Um, so for example, we need to be thinking about, you know, does the containment provide treatment on site? Will it need to be emptied? Um, who will empty it? Uh, are there, what kind of emptying services exist? Where will the waste go? Um, and does a treatment plant even exist? Does it function? Does it have sufficient capacity? We need to remain uh, technology agnostic. So we know that there's a lot of uh, technologies out there which um, have strengths and weaknesses depending on the context in which they operate. And we really need to try to avoid um, picking a silver bullet technology or services. Really, we really need to keep an open mind uh, about technology solution as long as they, uh, they meet minimum performance uh, standards for safety. We all know that often uh, we can't uh, do everything at once. Um, so it's important to identify the highest risks uh, that affect the most people and work on those first. And we'll hear uh, about this a bit more in the next few slides. And finally, we have to remember to include the workers. Um, safely managed means that people are doing that management. And sanitation workers are especially, um, especially important. We know that informal workers often work in horrific condition and safely managed sanitation really means um, that we need more of these workers and they need to, to, to have a, a safe uh, and, and dignified employment. Recommendation three recognize that sanitation should be delivered as part of local services. So in order to achieve efficiency, it needs to be coordinated with other local services, such as housing, transport, solid waste management, for example. And in order for sanitation to be sustainable and deliver health impacts, we need to ensure that sanitation interventions are coordinated with other interventions, such as water supply and hygiene, in order to have the most health benefits. Recommendation four focuses on the role of the health sector in sanitation. We all know that many aspects of sanitation services, uh, delivery and oversight are delivered outside uh, the health sector. And this is fine because the health sector uh, is not well placed, for example, to build infrastructure or to manage fecal sludge management services or regulate tariffs. However, um, there are six critical functions the health sector must fulfill to ensure uh, sanitation uh, protects public health. So first is contributing to sector coordination. So not necessarily leading, but ensuring that policy and plans support national health objectives. Similarly, the health sector should contribute to developing sanitation related norms and standards. For example, standard designs and performance criteria for treatment devices to ensure performance effectively interrupt disease transmission. 
specifically, the health sector should lead on making sure sanitation is included in health policy and program where sanitation is needed for primary prevention. Kate mentioned earlier cholera, and that's a classical example. But also making sure that um, sanitation um, status is included in health surveillance system to target investment in high disease burden areas. Finally, um, ensuring a sanitation promotion within health services and also ensuring that healthcare facilities have adequate sanitation uh, facilities for patients, staff, and carers, and that they are connected to safe sanitation system for treatment and disposal. With that, I will stop and I will hand over to my colleague, Betsy Maju, for the rest of the, the, the presentation. Thank you, Sophie. And a very good day to everybody who's joining us today. So Sophie has talked about what safely managed sanitation means, and Kay talked about why it's important. And I just want to take it a step further by talking about how we can start to embed safely managed sanitation into our national systems. And I think we're all aware that one of the challenges that the sanitation sector faces is fragmentation amongst government levels, so whether national, local government, but also even across ministries and across the service providers themselves. And so safely managed sanitation means that we need to be delivering our sanitation services as part of a coherent implementation framework, where there's a clear delineation of functions at the various levels of government, but also more importantly at local government, there's that real interface with the users at the local level where um, services are being accessed. So if you think about infrastructure, for instance, um, sewage networks will require huge investments um, normally from national government or even from regional and external entities. So having that level of coordination is absolutely vital. But then now when we start to think about, okay, we've got our implementation framework, what targets do you want to set for sanitation? The key message to emphasize that we need to set targets that are realistic, but also ambitious. So on the figure, you see that um, there's uh, the, the figure is outlining progress towards um, safety mind sanitation by 2030 by region. And what you will note is that there is no region that is actually on track for achieving this target of safety mind sanitation for all. Um, and actually for that to happen, for everyone to have safety mind sanitation at the current rates of progress would actually need to quadruple. And that is a huge, huge change that will be required. It's a huge challenge for a lot of countries around the world. So realistically speaking, it's not going to be possible for everyone everywhere to say that by 2030, we will all have safely managed sanitation. And this is where um, it's important to take stock of the current situation, be very realistic about existing resources, and also put some ambition into um, what can be done to accelerate progress. Another thing that we also need to be bearing in mind as we think about our setting our targets for safety managed sanitation is that actually on-site sanitation is growing quite rapidly. And in fact, it's growing um, twice as fast in urban areas compared to rural areas. So while it might be okay to have on-site systems with disposal of excreta in situ in rural areas, in urban areas, this might actually be posing a challenge. So when we think about in future, those sanitation systems will need to be empty, they'll need to be conveyance and treatment without the adequate infrastructure and investment now for all of that to happen, that will be a major challenge. So as we think about what targets we want to set for safely managed sanitation, we can go back to this service ladder that Sophie shared earlier and think about how we can progress from the yellow and orange rungs of the ladder. This, these are the rungs of the ladder that we want to move from to the green rungs of the ladder that actually represent safely managed sanitation. So a target um, example could be, for instance, eliminating open defecation by 2030 and having at least X percentage of the population having basic sanitation and having certain percentage of the population having safely managed services. And also to be clear that when we say safely managed, again, this is not to say that everyone everywhere is going to have sewer connections. Safely managed can also mean that there is safe disposal of that excreta in situ or on site but the point is it is safely disposed and separated from human exposure. Then we want to think about how we can set these targets. Um, what is really important is again, having a robust assessment of the current situation and understanding um, what resources there are to move forward. And at this point, it's really helpful to apply a risk-based 
um, assessments. And such risk-based assessments could use various tools, such as the excretive flow diagram that Kate showed earlier, where we can really start to think about where um, the greatest risks are occurring along the sanitation service chain and where we want to target those improvements in the sanitation service ladder. We can also be applying a, um, a different kind of tool, for instance, when we want to think about um, how we prioritize um, elimination of certain diseases. So we think about overlaying coverage of sanitation, for, for instance, with prevalence of sanitation related disease and target those areas that have the highest prevalence of disease for improvement. Or equally, there could be some other method of disaggregation where we, uh, such as poverty, geography or ethnicity. But the point is there is a systematic and robust tool or approach that is being used to understanding how we um, target areas for improvement of sanitation services. And the figure is just showing an example of what that phasing out of unsafe sanitation practices or system would look like. So you see that on the left, would be starting off with unsafe practices that are mostly in, green, in brown and red. And over time, those practices are being phased out um, and is essentially being eliminated. Um, but we are also phasing in the blue and green safe practices and making sure that over time, those are the ones that become prevalent. And just to emphasize that these safe practices are again, a mix of different types of sanitation systems. So it could be non sewer but with safe conveyance of the excreta and uh, appropriate treatment, or it could be um, centralized and decentralized sewage that has treatment. And again, like I mentioned, we could also use the disease-based approach. And this is where it's really important to be working with the health sector, where we can say, for instance, there are areas that we want to target for um, elimination of soil transmitted health ailments and overlaying that with um, uh, coverage of sanitation. So you see on the map that on the, you see on the figure, that the map on the left is showing areas that have low sanitation coverage and high prevalence of soil transmitted helmets. And on the right, it's showing low sanitation coverage and high prevalence of schistosomiasis. And those places that are in red are those um, high priority areas where those sanitation improvements could be prioritized. But all of these things need to be embedded in a robust regulatory framework in order to make sure that the services that we're delivering are actually safe, that there's some oversight to ensure that services are being delivered in the manner that they should be, and that we're actually reaching our targets. And regulation is really important for that. But there are some key principles that we want to keep in mind when we are regulating sanitation services. And one of those is that we need to be interpreting, um, interpreting what sanit safety managed sanitation means at each step of a service chain, and therefore what that might mean for regulation. So in other words, there is no one size fits all regulation that can be applied across the entire service chain. We really need to be looking at each step and think about and thinking about what regulatory mechanisms can be applied. We also need to be recognizing different types of sanitation systems. So both sword and non sword and making sure that there's inclusivity in those systems. Um, we need to be thinking about um, service quality in terms of how are these sanitation services are being delivered and um, how that relates to public health. So applying a public health based risk assessment and management approach to the delivery of those services. And Sophie already mentioned the importance of being technology agnostic, not just in the delivery of the services, but also in the regulation of those services. So not being too prescriptive about what technologies can be applied uh, when delivering sanitation services and what that means for regulation. We also need to set out levels of performance criteria and allow flexibility on how they can be achieved, recognizing that different communities might be at varying levels of development and really allowing for that incremental process, but ensuring that say, our services are still safe. And of course, we need to have the supporting legislation and bylaws, um, both at the national and local level, to make sure that all this works. So what does this mean in practice? Um, essentially, there are three questions that we want to answer when we're talking about the regulations that um, support embedding of safely managed systems, safely managed sanitation in our national systems. And those questions are where, what, and whom. So we've already touched a little bit on the where. So how, where can safely managed sanitation be reflected at the national and local level and in our regulatory systems? So again, there's no one size fits all. We go back to a sanitation service chain and look across the whole chain 
to think about, okay, what is already in existence? Are there already regulatory frameworks and mechanisms that are in existence? Um, to what extent are they influential and to what extent are they helping us to meet our sanitation related targets and also public health related targets with that. The next question that we want to be asking is what, so specifically what kind of regulations are going to be implemented? And because sanitation encompasses a range of sectors, it's not just environment or just water, there's also um, to do with urban and town planning, building regulations, etc. We also want to be thinking about what um, regulatory tools will be appropriate. So if we think about toilets, for instance, um, we want to think about construction codes for the installation of those toilets. When we think about conveyance, we want to be thinking about the safety of the sanitation workers who are going to be conveying the excreta, for instance, um, through um, as um, pit emptying services or desludging. Do those uh, uh, sanitation workers have appropriate personal protective equipment? Um, are they vaccinated? Are they actually carrying out their job in a safe manner? When we think about treatment, uh, it could be a public utility, a, a wastewater treatment plant, and what are the regulatory requirements that they are required to fulfill? Or if they're private um, entities, is there a licensing code that's in place? And then we also want to think about the end use or disposal of that excreta. Are there treatment standards that are in place? that should be met as uh, prior to um, disposal of that waste or um, its end use either for in agriculture or something else. And then the third question that we want to ask ourselves is the who. And I think this is a, a very thorny question in the sector, not just in terms of who is delivering the services, but who's actually responsible for regulating those services. And again, because there are multiple actors that are involved, there are multiple sectors. What is really important is mapping who is doing what, but also having alignment and making sure that where there are gaps, where there's discrepancy, that is addressed from the onset so that there's coherence across all the actors that are involved and across all the regulatory authorities. And then also when it comes to the, to the service delivery, the other question that we're asking is who's responsible, not just for regulating, but who is responsible for delivering those services and how are they regulated? So they're the individual services where, for instance, the plumber might be coming in to install your toilet, but then there are shared services such as um, the installation of the sewage network in town X. Those are very different entities and the way they're being regulated is also different. So understanding what gaps exist and making sure that um, there is alignment is very important. I think I'll stop here for now, but just to flag that this question of who is um, a question that we're trying to tackle um, as WHO and we're actually working on a roadmap um, to help regulators advance from having little or no regulation of sanitation to a functional regulatory system. And so we look forward to sharing with you from that or equally hearing from you on your experiences. And with that, I will hand it back to Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bessie. And so we've heard the four key recommendations of the WHO guidelines, and we've also heard, heard how to embed safely managed sanitation national systems. For, so back to the quiz, and we see who has been paying attention. Um, this time it's just true or false statements. Again, you have to scroll down to see the questions. Um, on the first question, full community coverage of at least basic sanitation is needed to protect health. Choose true or false. The next statement, implementation should first focus on increasing demand for toilets and then address supply. The third question, when choosing what sanitation system to use, planners should remain technolo technology agnostic so long as the solution meets minimum standards. The fourth question, work on the low risks first, as these are often cheaper and easier to implement. Is it true or false? The next statement says countries need to set ambitious but realistic targets for sanitation based on a robust analysis of the current situation and the potential for accelerated progress in sanitation by 2030. The last question, is that the sanitation service chain, that is toilets, conveyance, treatment, and so forth, is best served by a single dedicated regulatory mechanism. True or false? 
So I think within the next 10, 15 seconds, it's um, just a question of reading the statement and uh, picking whether it is true or false. And uh, then we see uh, what what's, uh, the results are looking like this time. And also in the meantime, thanks to Grace Kihumba, who was very attentive and realized that uh, the answers in the previous quiz, uh, most people had actually gotten them correct, and uh, which is good. So back to uh, the answers. Let's see what uh, it looks like. So the first question, which is about safe toilets, uh, full community coverage, or at least basic sanitation, is true. The lower level of coverage benefits households with privacy and convenience gain are typically not detected until at least 70% coverage is achieved. So most participants got that right. Well done. Um, the second question, uh, implementation should first focus on increasing demand for toilets, which is related, uh, which is false. Uh, well done to the 56% that answered. Uh, when choosing a sanitation system to use, uh, it is true. It, you should remain techno technology agnostic. Well done. Uh, the next question, um, the correct answer is, um, work on the low risk, the correct answer is that it is false. So again, uh, well done to the majority, 62% got that correct from the, those that answered. Question five, uh, which is on what countries uh, need to set uh, realistic targets. Uh, the correct answer is that it is true and really the majority got that correct, excellent. And on the last question, uh, the correct answer is that it is false. SMS at any step of the chain may require a combination of codes, technical standards, licensing, or utility regulation, not just a single dedicated regulatory mechanism. So well done for the correct answers. And we move on to the next presentation, which is looking at risk-based tools to implement safely managed sanitation and sanitation safety planning. Leonella, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. So I'm here to introduce one of the WHO recommended risk assessment and management tools, which is called sanitation safety planning. Uh, with this tool, what we can do is an in-depth assessment and prepare a management and investment plan. SSP is different from the SFT or excreta flow diagrams that is used for a rapid assessment with advocacy purposes. And also it is different from the sanitary inspection forms that are used to conduct a simplified assessment of on-site facilities. The SSP, uh, okay. the SSP um, is a step-by-step um, -step approach for local risk assessment and management along the entire sanitation service change that results in the identification of the highest health risk to plan improvements. The way how SSP works is very simple. First, we prepare for the process. Then we describe the sanitation system. Next, we identify hazards and hazardous events and conduct the health risk-based uh, assessment. The resulting information we use to take decisions about what improvements are needed. Then we define the monitoring mechanisms and finally, we develop supporting programs and review plans. To illustrate how SSP works, let's watch the following video. Hello, I'm Kate Medlicott, Technical Officer for Sanitation and Wastewater at the World Health Organization. In this video, I will give you an overview of sanitation safety planning and we'll look at an example. Sanitation safety planning, or SSP for short, is a risk-based management tool for sanitation systems. A safely managed sanitation system prevents exposure to disease-causing excreta at all steps of the sanitation chain, from containment through emptying, transport, treatment, and to disposal or reuse. It can be used together with excreta flow diagrams, or SFDs, shown in the previous module, to make sure that excreta reaches safe rather than unsafe endpoints. SSP reduces health impacts while increasing the benefits of reuse. SSP can be used for all kinds of sanitation systems, both in formal and informal settings. The approach is best used for improving existing systems. In communities with no sanitation, 
demand creation should be prioritised. So how do SSPs work? First, we need to understand the system we plan to manage. This is referred to as a system assessment phase, where the sanitation chain and exposure groups and pathways are identified and expressed as hazards. Risks are assessed, and when they are unacceptable, improvements are designed to reduce them. This approach ensures action is prioritised according to risk. Monitoring and management using multiple barriers along the chain ensure that the whole system is operating as intended. SSP can be applied in many settings. Today I'll be illustrating the approach in an informal urban setting typical of growing cities in many countries. We'll follow the chain showing examples of exposure groups, hazards, controls and monitoring at each step to build up a safely managed sanitation system that protects public health. Notice as we go that not all improvements involve expensive capital investment. Changes in management and behaviour can also significantly reduce risks. Also notice that different stakeholders bear responsibility for controls and monitoring at each step. Here is a simple pit latrine with manual emptying. Although excreta are contained in the latrine, this unimproved system poses a number of health risks. Exposure groups include the users, the workers, who empty the containers, and the surrounding community. Children and the elderly are especially vulnerable from contact with soiled surfaces in an unhygienic latrine. These groups may be exposed via direct excreta contact through the feet and hands, and when excreta is inadvertently transferred to the mouth via dirty hands or flies. The risks here are medium to high, depending on the exposure group. While the goal is a more hygienic, improved sanitation technology, we can still reduce risks. For example, controls such as wearing shoes, better cleaning of the latrine, personal protective equipment for workers, and using an emptying system that reduces direct contact will all incrementally improve the system. Visual monitoring of these measures by a community health worker is a simple way to check and respond if these controls are not in place. This latrine with septic tank is an improved technology that poses less risk to users than the previous situation. Let's look at the emptying process. Motorised emptying and transport is much safer than manual emptying, but there is still risk that need to be managed. A key exposure group is the workers. Hazardous events are mostly related to blockages and malfunction of the equipment. For example, the operators may be sprayed with sludge and also contaminate the surrounding area. These risks are typically high. Here are some controls to protect workers. Providing appropriate equipment, working according to standard operating procedures, and ensuring workers wear personal protective equipment. The organisation responsible for overseeing collection and transport can set minimum standards like these and make spot checks to monitor if they are followed. In this example, all of the faecal sludge is delivered to the treatment plant, but in poorly managed systems, some may be diverted to dumping sites. This can have serious health and environmental impacts. SSP should also identify dumping as a hazardous event and include controls and monitoring to manage these risks posed to the wider community. At the treatment step, it is vital that the treatment process operates well so that effluent and biosolids meet agreed standards. If not, users on farms and consumers of the farm produce will be exposed to an unacceptable risk. The hazardous events may include overloading of the plant, breakdowns, the processing temperature and time, and the presence of flies or mosquitoes, or seasonal factors such as high rainfall that may affect performance. The risks and consequences of these are high. Example controls include proper design and construction, trained operators and a preventive maintenance program. Monitoring may include periodic testing of effluent and checks on delivery volumes. But even the best treatment processes will occasionally not meet standards. In some cases, lower levels of treatment may be unavoidable with the existing technology or desired by farmers who wish to access nutrients for reuse. That's why barriers at the next reuse step are particularly important. 
During reuse, there are risks to farmers using the biosolids, especially where intestinal worm infections are prevalent. Risks will depend on the performance of the treatment plant in the previous step and the way the biosolids are applied in the farm, for example, manual or mechanical application. When produce is sold to the general population for consumption, many people are potentially at risk. Pathogens can be recycled back to the community at large and lead to a disease outbreak. This is costly in terms of public health, but can, it can also ruin the reputation and operation of businesses that reuse wastewater and sludge. The type of crop grown and the application method affects the risk for consumers. For example, crops eaten raw have a much higher risk compared with crops which are cooked or processed before eating. These risks are potentially high. Controls that can be used include selection of crops not eaten raw, setting a time between the last application and harvesting to allow pathogens to die off naturally, and washing of produce in clean water before sale. Monitoring may include checking crop types, application and harvesting practice, as well as hygiene during the packing and sale. We have just followed the modules in the SSP manual. First, describing the sanitation system, identifying hazardous events and exposure risks, developing and implementing improvement plans, monitoring controls and verifying performance. Coordination among stakeholders is needed to implement all controls and monitoring in a safely managed system. That's why establishing a team at the outset with members representing each step of the chain is vital to prepare for SSP. Coordination can be challenging, but evidence shows that safely managed systems lead to far higher health gains than improved sanitation alone. Further, using the multiple barrier approach reduces dependence on capital and intensive treatment technologies as the main barrier. Controls can be included at any step and incrementally improved over time as resources permit. In summary, SSP is a risk-based tool for safely managing existing sanitation systems. SSP coordinates improvements and monitoring by actors along the sanitation chain. SSP does not rely on treatment only. It uses multiple barriers, including behaviours, management and technology to prevent exposure. The SSP manual that includes more guidance and tips is available in several languages on the WHO website, along with other resources to help users get started and implement SSP. So we invite you to visit the WHO's Learning Hub, which you find in ssp-learninghub.creation.camp. There you will see that you will be able to find an online training which has different uh, videos and resources to learn about each of the ste these steps and also implement them. Also, there is a training package that is designed specifically for SSP trainers with a training guide, PowerPoints and materials ready, ready to be used. And finally, there is also a library that contains all supporting documents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Following from uh, the presentation of Leonela, uh, I just wanted to, uh, to quickly um, uh, talk about sanitary inspections. I'm trying to advance to the next slides. Thank you. Um, so a simpler form of risk assessment and management is sanitary inspection. And that consists of a simple observation, uh, standardized observation checklist, uh, which can be used to assess risks and also identify uh, corrective uh, actions. Um, the, uh, the sanitation inspections, they really look at um, the parts of the sanitation chain that can be observed at the household level. So um, that's, that only covers the toilet and containment as well as on-site treatment step um, of the chain. So just important to note that other tools are needed uh, to assess uh, conveyance and treatment and disposal or reuse of site. So the sanitation inspection form are part of a package and one of the elements of the package uh, is, um, is a, a set of sanitation system fact sheets. Um, which uh, includes uh, a lot more details on applicability um, of different sanitation systems based on context, as well 
as uh, some design consideration. Sorry, so the, this is part of a, I'll try to keep it quick because I know we're running out of time. So the sanitation system fact sheets are part of a, a set of tools uh, that includes um, a fact sheet that gives detail on applicability, design consideration, operation and maintenance, as well as measures to protect uh, public health for 11 commonly used sanitation uh, systems. Um, um, and uh, you can see here an example of the list of the sanitation um, inspection forms uh, with the, the list of observations. Uh, the form is available in PDF format as well as online on the, the platform, online platform, uh, which is hosted by MWater. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's multiple benefits of using uh, sanitary inspection forms. They are user friendly. They can be used by non-specialists. They're easy and uh, quick way of um, identifying hazards. Uh, they are suitable uh, when there's limited amount of time and resources. Uh, they can be easily adapted to different contexts, and they can be aggregated to support um, safely managed sanitation in situ. Of course, there's a number of limitations. There's a limited number of questions. Uh, the risks that are below ground and inside the containment are not easily observed. Um, another issue is that they assume every risk has an equal value, and we know that it's not always true, uh, and it also requires adaptation to local context. Next slide. Um, as I said, they're available in PDF and online. Um, so one of the common challenge um, that, uh, that is faced is how to sustain open defecation free status and how to move up the ladder to safely manage sanitation services. So the sanitary inspection form can really be used by local governments that, uh, in order to to support uh, in, to support um, programs to prevent backsliding, to open defecation, to make some upgrades um, of unimproved toilets to at least basic toilets, um, and when, whenever it's uh, possible to achieve safely managed sanitation uh, on site or with fecal sludge emptying and treatment. And to monitor status and aggregate data to national level for regulation purposes, as well as for SDG 6.2 monitoring. Next slide, please. So here we will uh, look at an example of the use of um, the use of sanitary inspection uh, in Ireland, uh, and um, you will see. Uh, um, a, a few slides uh, from the uh, Irish EPA. Um, um, and you will have a, a short quiz uh, if we're able to have time, but um, I just wanted to highlight a few features that you will have to look at uh, during the presentation. Uh, the first one is um, the risk-based approach to the selection of household for inspection, that they use small but nationally representative sample for conducting inspections. Um, the inspection links, um, to, they are linked to follow up uh, improvement by households and municipalities. Um, throughout this uh, initiative, uh, they deploy information, incentives, and enforcement mechanisms to support system upgrades. Uh, and it, it also enables to strengthen national and local uh, data governance and accountability to national and regional regulators. Next slide, please. Here we will learn about the regulation of domestic wastewater treatment systems in Ireland and see background information on the regulatory system. There are four main areas. The first relates to planning control regulations and standards that are required for the construction and installation of domestic wastewater treatment systems in Ireland. The second relates to the registration and inspection of these systems under the National Inspection Plan. Inspections are completed nationally but prioritised in highest risk areas. The third area relates to the grant schemes that are available to fix systems that fail inspection. And lastly, the local authorities may deal with some complaints regarding septic tanks and they may carry out inspections following the receipt of a complaint. This is a list of the main legislation relating to septic tanks. The Water Services Amendment Act was brought into law in 2012. The Domestic Wastewater Treatment System Regulations, which govern the operation and maintenance of domestic wastewater treatment systems, and the requirements for desludging were also brought into law in 2012. At the bottom of the list are the Housing Financial Assistance Regulations 
that brought the septic tank grant schemes into law to help householders fix systems that fail inspections and in other areas. Inspection responsibilities are provided for under the Water Service Amendment Act that was brought into law in 2012. Homeowners had to register existing systems by the 1st of February 2013. The homeowner is required to comply with regulations and they must ensure that the system is not a risk to human health or the environment. The homeowners can't refuse, obstruct, impede, mislead or fail to comply with an inspection. The water services authorities are the local councils and they must take and maintain registrations and this is done through the protectourwater.ie website. The water services authority inspectors conduct the inspections of the domestic wastewater treatment systems and they enforce the findings and issue advisory notices on the inspections. The EPA's responsibility is to appoint inspectors, issue the national inspection plan and supervise the water services authorities work in this area. Some of the key requirements of regulations are shown in red on this slide. Domestic wastewater treatment systems should not leak. Roof water or surface water should not be allowed to enter the system. All parts of the system should be fit for purpose. Systems should be dislodged at appropriate intervals by an authorised contractor. The EPA provides a simple reference table on its website to help homeowners establish what an appropriate interval would be for their system. Homeowners need to keep receipts of desludging. Overall, homeowners should ensure that their system is not a risk to human health or the environment. The National Inspection Plan began in 2013. The next plan covered the period 2015 to 2017, then 2018 to 2021, and the latest plan covers 2022 to 2026. Under the most recent plan, water services authorities are required to complete a minimum of 1,000 inspections nationally per annum. This increases to 1,200 from 2023. They may complete additional inspections where evidence exists that domestic wastewater treatment systems are causing an issue in a particular catchment. The 1,000 or 1,200 inspections are prioritised into areas of highest relative risk. These are close to rivers and areas with shallow soils and drinking water wells. The number of inspections are allocated to water services authorities pro rata based on the proportion of houses in those risk areas in the water services authority area. Specific site selection is done annually by the water services authorities using a map and tables which show the various risk zones and the number of inspections to be completed in each risk zone as set out in the national inspection plan. Inspectors in the Water Services Authorities attend a training course. There are approximately 100 inspectors nationally. Inspectors would expect the following from a good system. No rainwater or clean surface water entering the system. No leaks, no ponding, no unauthorised discharges. Components in working order. Proper maintenance and operation being completed. The system is dislodged and the system is not a risk to human health and the environment. If a system fails and remediation is required, the Water Services Authority issues an advisory notice to the homeowner, which outlines the measures required to fix the system and the timelines for completion of remediation works. If any structural remediation works need to be completed, there are planning exemptions under the planning and development regulations to allow homeowners to improve a system without requiring planning. Also, variances to the code of practice requirements may be considered by the local authority. There are grants available to help homeowners fix systems that fail in an inspection, so this allows them to fix their systems more readily. So, just to give you a flavour of the latest report, the Domestic Wastewater Treatment System Inspections Report was published in June 2022 and reported on the inspections completed in 2021. There were 1,147 inspections completed in 2021, and these found that 53% of systems that were inspected failed inspection. Overall, in the period from when the National Inspection Plan began in 2013 to the end of 2021, 
75% of systems that failed have been fixed. So that leaves a quarter of them that still need to be fixed. In some of these, legal cases have been initiated. In total, 36 legal actions have been initiated by seven water services authorities nationally. The figure shows the reasons for failure. It should be noted here that individual systems can fail for multiple reasons. You will see that the leading issue found is that homeowners do not desludge and maintain their tanks. The pictures were taken by inspectors in the field and they show a discharge to a surface water drain and effluent ponding around a septic tank. The final slide outlines some of the engagement work that is carried out in this area. This is done to provide information to the public about inspections, the risk of their systems not working properly and how they can fix their systems. Several information leaflets have been published to help with public engagement, which are used by water services authorities to inform the public in their area. The EPA also publishes a simple infographic to inform the public of the findings of the latest inspections report. It gives a very high level flavour of what the inspections are finding and where homeowners can find assistance to enable them to fix their systems. So thanks. We hope that this presentation gave you some insights into uh, some of the uses and benefits of the sanitary inspection. Now I'll hand over to Yvonne for the, the quiz. Thank you very much, Sophie. And uh, thank you for, to Lionel as well for the two presentations. The quiz is uh, the third quiz. Um, very quickly, we'll have just one minute for this quiz. Um, there are four questions um, in this quiz and uh, you pick the correct answer. The first one, which type of risk assessment approach is best used for in-depth assessment and management of investment planning? Second, how were households selected for inspection? The third question is what kind of measures were used to get households to fix failing systems? And how is the data reported and used? So I will also be requesting um, our two panelists to get ready as we move from um, the quiz to a panel discussion. We'll have exactly five minutes um, for each panelist to be able to give us practical uh, perspective of the issues that have been presented today. So uh, we'll close the quiz and uh, look at what the answers are. Hopefully you've had a chance to, to answer. So the first question, the correct answer is B. Uh, excellent, those who managed to answer. Uh, sanitation safety planning is the answer there. Um, households selected for inspection, question two. Um, the correct answer is C. So again, well done to those who managed to answer. You got it correct. Uh, question three. Um, what kind of measures were used to get households to fix failing systems? The correct answer is actually D, all of the above. And most participants got that right as well. So the last question in the poll is how is the data reported and used? Um, the correct answer is again D for all the purposes indicated there. Thank you very much for having participated in the quiz. We'll now move to our two panelists. Charlotte is from Ghana and Dr. Vijay is from um, India. Um, Charlotte, if you can just uh, switch on your, your video, thank you. Um, Charlotte has spent the last two de decades working at the local, regional, and national levels in Ghana's water and sanitation sector and also in several donor funded projects. Based on your experience, uh, uh, Charlotte, how can the key recommendations, the four key recommendations that are given of the uh, WHO guidelines on sanitation and health be addressed at these levels? Over to you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Certainly, achieving safely managed sanitation for countries is a, a big deal, especially in Africa. In Ghana, for instance, if you look at our coverage now, we have only 59.3% of the household owning toilets, then 23% using public facilities and 17.7% practicing OP defecation. So if you look at the four recommendations that's presented by WHO, safe sanitation, 
For instance, in Ghana, we have the urban sanitation strategy. We have most of the urban settlements practicing open edification. So with this strategy, we are promoting improved sanitation at the household level. And you know, when you go to the implementation side of this, there are a lot of challenges that you have to deal with. You have availability of space being a challenge, affordability of certain class of the people. You are looking at even technology poor of some of your communities, technical assistance from the local governance structure, and even the quality of service delivery that is provided. So if you look at the whole value chain, you need to come up with innovative solutions. And we focus on behavioral change and communication strategies to be able to educate the populace to understand the importance of improved sanitation and then safe water. So with these interventions, we get a lot of demand for the facility. And then on the step of supply, you realize that you don't even have the sanitation businesses to even meet the demand of the people. So you need to build your supply space, bringing in artisans to train, forming cooperative for private sector to be able to secure guarantee funds and all that. And of course, the safety of your empty career, the treatment in Ghana, we don't have a regulative body that manage the sanitation services. So most of the emptying, the treatments are done by private sector, but they are licensed by the local government. So you need to support them with training. And we have social and environmental safeguards frameworks where we are able to train them on occupational health and safety, being able to support them with PPEs and all that to protect them as well. But if you look at the chain itself, you need a very strong coordinated platform for all stakeholders to play their role. For instance, the uh, Ghana, we learned in a, a bitter way in 2015, where our water quality was compromised during the flooding. So the health surveillance system gave us the alert of cases of cholera, and we reported several cases of cholera. And by the time we were like the whole country, there was an outbreak. So the surveillance system helped us to put National Technical Working Group for WASH. And we have members from NGO, civil society, government, education, health, and this platform, they all coordinate the plan. So we come up with plan, we look for funding, and then we do the dissemination. But of course, you need to bring in your social norms tools to be able to catch up with your others, so your religion, the faith-based organizations, the traditional leaders, and all that. But government investment on the treatment is very critical because investing in the infrastructure for treatment is expensive. But when you go down to the local level and you're able to bring in some innovations in technology, you look for simplified sewage systems, you look at condominial systems, DWAS and all that, you are able to break the barrier of contamination at that small scale. But on the larger scale, we are looking at fecal slug management systems for our cities, for the secondary cities, even the population is just 5,000, you should be able to have a system that will be able to serve them to break the challenge. So the four recommendations are very good. If you implement it, you'll be able to at least reduce your spread of uh, diseases or contamination and your public health will be improved. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlotte, and uh, very uh, valid points that you've raised there. Uh, very pertinent to um, achieving safely managed sanitation. We move to uh, Dr. Vijay. Uh, you yourself have also been involved in policy and program formulation uh, in the Ministry for Public Health Engineering sector, uh, which included also implementation of clean India mission. So how has implementing transformative wash, where we're talking about reducing risks at all steps of the chain to achieve the health impact, how has that led to India's open defecation free status? Over to you. Thank you, Yun. Uh, my greetings to all audiences. Uh, through this uh, webinar, I think safely managed sanitation is very well explained and we have come across that at various levels uh, what are precautions to be taken and what to be done. As far as India's journey for 
this open defecation uh, is concerned. This was launched in 2014. At that time, open defecation was even prevalent, cleanliness and the general awareness not to that level that is expected. So after launch of this mission, we uh, adopted a strategy that in mission mode, we were incentivizing also, we were uh, making it as a public movement also. And apart from that, along with implementation and financial support, we took this step that how to encourage people like competitive spirit we brought through a, uh, let us say, uh, competition that we call Clean Survey of Cities. That is the largest, uh, I will say, uh, survey we call such a survey uh, in the world in urban area, if you say, around, uh, around uh, 400 million of these participants were participating in that. So that was bringing a lot of competition between the cities and they were trying to meet various requirements that how they become open defecation free even cleanliness and other thing also they bring. So in, in that case, apart from that, we launch further this open defecation certification. In first stage, it started that people should have their own toilets and nobody should go for open defecation. That give a very marvelous success because of the all consulted efforts. But we didn't stop to that. We went to next level where the proper containment was also targeted through ODF plus, that is a variant of higher level. And then we went for convince and then proper uh, treatment that comes uh, fecal treatment at ODF plus plus. And then lastly, we took as a, uh, the highest level water plus where it was a sustainable sanitation, like apart from proper treatment, it is being recycled, reused. Exactly if you see this wash chain, that transformative wash chain that it say the risk at all steps, these all the steps we have covered. Uh, maybe I am not very much uh, exposed to these definitions earlier, I will say, but uh, uh, fortunately, these all definitions we were following. And when we acquainted that what is the JMP and what is safely managed sanitation, in that case, we find that what is the requirement exactly on the same line we are moving. And we are targeting because after this Clean India mission, we are uh, we are extending a second version where we are funding for this water sanitation portion also, so that uh, not only uh, uh, not only containment but proper treatment is also taken. Apart from lastly, I would like to mention that uh, this SFD sick flow diagram also we bring in our advisory and uh, these guidelines that also help people to plan and identify gap and uh, the welfare of uh, uh, these employee working in sanitation sector, they were also taken and that was taken that maximum it should be done in a mechanized mode, not manual at any cost. And for that, a legislation was also brought. These all things has brought to such a level that we are aspiring that we will be able to achieve this whole uh, transformative vast chain that is there up to end use. And we are uh, we are heading towards this sustainable sanitation and also sustainability and circularity in our system. So this is all I wanted to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vijay. Very practical experience there and uh, some, some good issues for people to be able to draw on, particularly related to issues of definitions and uh, the implication for, for the sector and what is counted as safely managed sanitation. There are a lot of questions uh, in the Q&A. Unfortunately, due to time limitations, we weren't able to, to um, take them all uh, for, for response. However, there are resources uh, that are related to um, this learning package that WHO has uh, presented. And uh, we are very grateful for uh, everybody's inputs. And I'll just request Kate just to uh, talk about how people can be supported. There are a number of things that are coming up um, in the Q&A, some suggestions also that uh, people are putting across. Kate, um, how can uh, participants uh, gain more insight and uh, how can they be supported? 
Thank you, Yvonne. Yes, so there's a huge range of resources here, which we've just gone over lightly. We're, we're um, keen to hear from, from any of you who would like to go into more detail on any of these topics. We do provide um, country or region based training, but most specifically what's coming next is the, the poll where we can offer more in depth sessions uh, via webinar on the things that you find most interesting here. So we'd really like to hear from you um, yeah, what you'd like to, to learn more about via uh, IWA webinars. And so please uh, have a look at the poll here and we'll take those into account and work with the IWA team to, uh, to develop more in-depth material uh, in response to your request. So uh, go ahead and um, we'll close the poll in uh you know maybe uh 30 seconds and i think that is that's us for for the day so um thank you so much um kate and i want to say thank you to the who team thank you to the iowa team um for having uh and co-hosted this uh webinar um on the who uh introducing the new who learning package for safety managed sanitation so there are other um, learning opportunities also coming up under IRA. Uh, there is the regional call uh, for connecting young water professionals in the Americas. There is also a webinar on embracing indigenous perspectives to achieve sustainable development goals. But do not forget also that there is an anti-sewage sanitation conference coming up um, in October in, in Johannesburg. Please look it up. And also the Iowa Development Congress that is coming up in Kigali in December. So please register, uh, participate, and uh, keep interacting on these issues so that we're able to uh, make a positive impact on the sector. Iowa is also calling you to become a member of the network if you're not yet a member. So thank you to everyone, and uh, have a good day, good evening, and uh, we'll see you next time.